So the, dom the, the biggest answer is stay the same. Somebody want to tell me what you're thinking about in stay the same? Because I like stay the same. Yeah? So U1 and U3 are the same. Um, so process 1 and 3. Right, our indicators are thermal and bond. So bond isn't changing, so thermal has to be the same as one and 3. So delta U is zero, delta E bond is zero because there's no bond energy, so delta E thermal must be zero. So no temperature change. Any question about that? Anyone have a different way of thinking about that one? What about on this graph here? What's that process, that last step? Here's one to two. How do I get to, to step three? How do I get to state three? What kind of a process is that? What could you call that? Is there something kept constant between two and three? Volume. So what's a constant volume process look like on this kind of graph? Vertical line. So this thing is going to go straight up. How far up? Back to the isothermal line. Back to the constant. This line right here, this dotted line, is an isothermal line. It's a constant temperature line. And we went back to the same temperature. We got back to the same temperature. So we added heat to get back to the same temperature. In the first step, one to two, we took work energy out. In the next step, two to three, we put heat energy in. And we put in just as much heat energy between two and three as we took out between one and two. So the end result is that the internal energy didn't change the internal energy is the same at 1 and 3. And so the temperature is the same. And so if the temperature is the same at 1 and 3, then the ideal gas law tells you how pressure varies with volume. 3 certainly has twice the volume, so it has half the pressure. So any question about that process right now? Or those two processes. All right, I want to talk about, I'm going to come back to this in terms of entropy. But first I've got to tell you what entropy is. Um, entropy is a state variable. I'll try to explain how you know it's a state variable when I tell you what it is. Um, it's a state variable that tells us about equilibrium. The first law of thermodynamics doesn't tell you anything at all about equilibrium. All it tells you is if energy was transferred from something to something else, then the total amount of energy in the universe didn't change. So if the gas on this side of the room transfers all of its thermal energy to the gas on this side of the room, first of all, everybody on this side is going to be really cooking. Uh, but but that's but energy can be conserved, and there's nothing saying that that can't. There's nothing in the first law that says that can't happen. The particles here can start can hit the particles over here, and when they hit them, all the ones over here start moving faster, and that slows down the ones over here on the other side. And there's nothing wrong. There's nothing in the first law that tells you that can't happen. All it, the first law tells you is that whatever energy this side lost, this one gained. That's what the first law tells you. Nevertheless, you never see that happen. One side of the room never just, just starts growing cold, while the other side starts to heat up all by itself. Our answer for why you never see that happen. It, it seems kind of a cheat, but that's our best answer. The reason you never see it happen is because it's not very likely. It's not because it literally can't happen. It's because it's so unlikely that you can wait a really long time and you'll never see it. So it's a question of statistics. 
And that means we have to say something about probabilities. So I thought I would tell you a little bit about how we're going to talk about probabilities. Um, the most likely state, the most probable one, is the highest probability. So I better tell you what the probability of some state is. State, for instance, could be the gas in this room, all of the energy on that side, and none of the energy on this side. That's one possible state of the gas in this room. That's a state we never see. Why not? Well, the probability of finding some state depends on the number of ways that you can get that state. And I'll have to tell you what that means in a second. Divided by the total number of things that could happen. The things that could happen may not be appropriate to that state. For instance, one of the things that could happen is that there's equal amounts of energy on both sides. And then that's not the state where there's no energy here and a lot of energy there. Um, another way of phrasing that is in terms of microstates. The number of ways of getting a particular state is, we're going to call that the number of microstates. So let me tell you what I mean by that. <coughs> when I say state, we've been talking about states of a system, equilibrium state. I could have said, and maybe should have said at the time, equilibrium macro state. We have states determined by these macroscopic variables. The total energy, the volume, the number of particles. The total energy is, doesn't tell you what any one atom is doing. It just says we add up all the energies of all the atoms and we get that. That's the total energy of the, of the, of the state. The volume, that's just the space occupied by those atoms. N is the number of atoms. These are macroscopic variables. They don't tell you what any one atom is doing. So, conversely to macrostate, microstate. The microstate is when you actually do say what every single atom is doing. This atom is here. This one is over here. This one has this much energy. This one has this much energy. If I have Avogadro's number of atoms and I tell you what the, how each of them is moving, and I also tell you where every one of them is, so now I've given you a, a great big Excel file with Avogadro's number of lines in it and each line has the location of an atom and where, how the atom is moving. Then I've told you the microstate. Avogadro's, I don't think Excel generally works with, with Avogadro's number of lines, but uh, that's a lot of data. Microstates are when you specify what every, something about every atom. So let me go back to the simplest thing you can, you can do. Instead of talking about atoms, we're going to talk about a coin. Um, I'm going to flip a coin. There's only two, two microstates that coin can be in. The coin can be sitting here with heads up. The coin can be sitting with, with tails up. Those are the only two possibilities. I'm going to ignore the rest of them as negligibly likely. It's landing on the side, all whatever else you might think the coin might do. So there's two pot, the total number of microstates, the total number of things that coin can do is two. The number of the ways, to, how many microstates are there if the coin is heads? Well, there's only one of those. And so the ratio, the number of microstates for heads divided by the total number of microstates is just one half. And so you say the probability of heads is a half or 50-50. Well, one coin is easy. Several coins is still just a counting problem. This is not quite coins, but it's almost the same thing. 
This is a picture of a room with four atoms in it. Each of these little things is supposed to be an atom. These arrows are supposed to tell you how fast it's moving and in what direction. So this one's moving fast that way. This one's moving slow that way. The atoms are going to smack around. They're going to hit each other. They're going to transfer energy back and forth. They're going to bounce around in here. They're going to bounce around against each other. Every once in a while, they will come to this hole in the partition between the two and go through. So an atom can go from the right to the left, or from the left to the right, if it hits the hole. Because they're bouncing around essentially randomly, if we actually set this thing up, we would sometimes find all four atoms on the right. Sometimes all four atoms on the left. But any of these, distrib any of these states are a possible state. So, how many states are there? Well, any atom number one has two possible states. It can be on the left or on the right. Right now I'm being really crude with the location of the atom. All I'm saying is left or right. Not exactly where it is. I could be more careful, but left or right is good enough. There's two ways that atom number one can be there. For any one of those, if atom number one's on the left, there's two ways for atom number two. If atom number one's on the right, there's two ways for atom number two. So there's four ways, four possible states of the two atoms. For any of those four, atom number three can be either on the right or on the left. So in the end, you multiply all those together and you find out there's 16 possible microstates. If I tell you where each atom is, that's a microstate. There's 16 of those for n equals four and, and two halves of a room. And you can list them all, and I'm listing them here according to which particles are found on the left-hand side. So, what's the most likely thing? Well, you probably have a good guess, and so I'm not going to ask you. The most likely thing is two on the left, two on the right. What's the probability of that? Number of microstates that give you two on the left and two on the right divided by the total number of microstates that you have. You have 16 microstates total. That's the total number of things that could happen. How many are, have two on the left and two on the right? Well, here's two on the left. One and two both on the left. Here's another one. Particles one and four on the left. Particles two and four on the left. Particles 1 and 3 on the left, 2 and 3 on the left, and 3 and 4 on the left. There's six of them. Six of these microstates have two particles on the left and therefore have the other two particles on the right. Six of them are an equal distribution. So the probability that that'll show up is 6 sixteenths. That's the biggest probability it turns out that you have. What about three of them on the left? Well, here's one. One, two, and four are on the left. There's another. One, two, and three are on the left. One, three, and four are on the left. Two, three, and four are on the left. So there's four of them that have three on the left. And so that's four sixteenths is the probability of that. It's somewhat less probable than an equal distribution. So that's the game that we're playing here. Um, it's a counting game. All you have to do is count things. Now the trouble is counting stuff starts to become hard when you have more than this many. When, when you have to use your hands more than two or three times, then counting becomes a little harder. Like when you have Avogadro's number of atoms, then counting becomes really hard. Um, <clears throat> so we're basically not going to have you do the counting. But what I want to point out is that even though there's some possibility that all the particles here will be on the right, in fact, if there's nothing on the left, then all the particles are on the right. There's one state that has one microstate that does that. So the probability of that is one sixteenth. 
that's only one sixth the probability that they're equally distributed. So you're going to see that some of the time. When you get more and more particles, the probability of these weird ones gets really, really small. And you probably already know that. If I take a hundred, if I had a hundred particles, the problem, you wouldn't expect to sit there and wait for all 100 of them to show up on one side. That is not going to happen very often. In fact, you could wait a long time watching those particles bounce around and not see all 100 of them on one side. You might see 50-50, you might see 49-48, uh, you might see numbers near 50-50 relatively often, but you'll almost never you, it's close to being never see all the particles on one side. And that's just with a hundred. With Avogadro's number like we have in this room, uh, you know, that's as good a definition of never as you're going to get if you wait for billions of lifetimes of the universe just watching this room, uh, it's not going to happen. It is so unlikely that you're not going to see it and you don't ever see it and so we just say it never happens.